Okay, so uh, good morning, um, everybody. Um, we're very happy to welcome today in this new session of the CPR CSH workshop, Dr. Uh, Sanjeev Mutwe. Uh, Sanjeev is currently an assistant professor in the Institute of Asian Studies at the University of uh, Brunei, Darussalam. He's a sociologist, anthropologist, he's a critical urbanist, and he specializes in uh, migrations in South Asia. So the book he's going to tell us about today is uh, the recently published um, The Right to be Counted, The Urban Poor and the Politics of Resettlement in Delhi. So that was published by Stanford University Press uh, this year only. And Sanjay is uh, also currently writing the next book, titled The Plumbers of Delhi, Migration, Caste Sociality and Citizenship in an Occupational Community. But today we're gonna hear about the right to be counted, the urban poor and the politics of resettlement in Delhi. So um, Sanjeev, the floor is yours and you have about 45 minutes. Thank right. you. Right, thanks. So thank you for inviting me uh, to give this book talk. Uh, it is really a great honor to be part of the CPR CSH urban book, uh, urban uh, workshop series. And I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to share some of the main arguments of my book. Uh, titled The Right to be Counted, uh, The Urban Poor and the Politics of Resettlement in Delhi. Over the last uh, decade, I've been researching about how the poor migrants from various parts of India claim a host of citizenship rights in Delhi, especially in the context of widespread demolition of their settlements. Based on this research, my book contributes to scholarly and public debates on the contradictions between state government mentality and the citizenship projects projects of the poor themselves. In so doing, I explore how the planning process contributes to social suffering, but also the logic of resistance and the cultural idioms of political mobilization, which emanate from the processes of displacement and resettlement in Delhi. Can you move on to the second slide, please? In order to compare and contrast the modalities of uh, uh, state calculative governmentality enshrined in the urban restructuring processes and to trace the logics of political mobilization among the urban poor, I have chosen a Jugi Jopri settlement, which I have labeled as Gautam Nagar Jugi Jopri settlement, a transit camp, which I have designated as Sitapuri transit camp, and a new resettlement colony, which I have named Azad Resettlement Colony for ethnographic study. The three neighborhoods are all state recognized settlements in that the residents of these neighborhoods all possess documents proving residence. In other words, they are relatively well entrenched in the political landscape of the city compared to the poor in the other types of social spaces, such as pavements or unrecognized Yogi Jopri settlements, who are considerably less able to claim housing rights in the city. I make my arguments about numerical citizenship based on 25 months of ethnographic and documentary research, 22 months between November 2009 and August 2011, and three months between June and September 2017 in these three neighborhoods and a range of state institutions. Can you move on to the next slide, please? But let me uh, first explain what I mean by numerical citizenship. Many of Delhi's urban poor or poor uh, transition from being migrants in the city to residents in unidentified Jogi Jopri settlements, that is precarious and improvised apartments, to residents in state recognized Jogi Jopri settlements, transit camps, or resettlement neighborhoods. Once they settle in a state recognized Jogi, they come under the purview of state regulations and calculations. Their struggles then shape the degree to which they may gain access to sets of entitlements, especially the provision of housing, the rudimentary infrastructure, and basic amenities, which constitute citizenship in Delhi. In analyzing citizenship, the political theorist Nirja Jayal provides a succinct analysis of how the three dimensions of citizenship, quote, citizenship as legal status, citizenship as a bundle of rights and entitlements, and citizenship as a sense of identity and belonging, unquote, are imagined and practiced in India. In, in my book, I primarily focus on one aspect of citizenship 
by examining the complex tactics and counter tactics of the poor in obtaining a range of social rights and entitlements in the city. Political and economic relationships, even as they forge and build kinship networks and develop alliances of solidarity across a political and social spectrum in their struggles to gain a foothold in the city. Their, their overlapping struggles to build juggies or hutments, to obtain access to welfare and to provide for basic needs, but also to stop displacements, gain eligibility for resettlement and secure proof documents constitute a distinctive mode of advancing material claims and political belonging in the city. At the core of these struggles lie incremental efforts to gain visibility from the local stage. The right to be counted describes this process of claims making as a struggle for numerical citizenship or the struggles to be counted and for a political community of the poor to assert its numerical strength. Struggles over numerical citizenship constitute the systematic, protracted, and incremental political processes by which the poor become entrenched in the city. It is not merely a, uh, merely a politi politics of presence, as Asad Bayat argues in another context, or the assertion of a right to exist, but also a struggle to be visible, to be identified, to be recognized, and to be made eligible for food, shelter, and basic amenities and infrastructure in the city. In this presentation, I'll provide citizenship struggles and provide an overview of the main theoretical arguments of my book. And subsequently, I will briefly share the contents of the chapters of my book. Next slide, please. Now let me turn to an example of how the poor residents document their residence in Jugi neighborhoods in their quest of citizenship entitlements. In the early 1970s, a few residents took over an inhospitable patch of land near an industrial area to build Jugis. I'm talking about Gautam uh, Nagar uh, Jugi Jopli camp now. They cleared part of a jungle near their workplaces to build shacks made up of gunny bags, plastic sheets, straw, bamboo, and other materials. Their numbers grew gradually after more people started building huts, clearing and refilling the land as necessary. The settlement then expanded further into an industrial area, which in turn adjoined several urban villages. Soon police officers started intervening by either tearing apart these partly built structures or by demanding payments to leave the residents alone. Self-styled strongmen eventually emerged from the neighborhood to negotiate with the police for protection against demolition in exchange for money. The strongmen even enclosed a portion of the land and distributed land parcels within it for a price while building more juggies to rent out or sell to newer residents. In addition to harassment from the police, the residents had to encounter the hostility of the already established populations of the village as well. The strong men then negotiated with his residents, especially regarding issues related to thefts and property damages. Gradually, the settlement gained leverage through the increase in its numbers. And as residents asserted themselves at key events, including elections to demand infrastructure and recognition of the neighborhood. Once the residents got into the electoral database of the state, the settlement became enmeshed in the vote bank politics, wherein the clients voted for partic particular parties in exchange for recognition and extension of services. Thus, the migrants became Jugi residents or owners over the years, and the unrecognized Jugi settlement became a state recognized Jugi Jopri colony, the Gautam Nagar camp. When a part of Gautam Nagar was demolished in 2009 for a road widening project, the residents fought a protracted battle with courts and the government of National Capital Territory of Delhi. On August 22, 2017, the Delhi Urban Shelter Improvement Board decided to resettle the residents of Gautam Nagar um, in, 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 in a resettlement colony. Aware that the board rejected their claim to resettlement on the slightest pretext, the residents decided to meet their member of the Legislative Assembly to seek guidance and support in fixing any minor errors in their documents. The MLA had served 
as an elected councillor from Bahujan Samaj Party between 2009 and 2011 during my first round of period work. In 2017, during my second round of period work, he served as an MLA from the Aam Admi Party. Although from a Gujarat community, from a nearby village, he spent a considerable amount of time socializing with the residents even before he entered politics. The residents claimed that he was mentored and encouraged to join politics by one of their local leaders, a Pradhan or chief, who was familiar with the political processes and landscape of Delhi. The politician was immensely popular in the neighborhood, but the residents distanced themselves from him after the demolitions in 2009 because he was not very helpful in their resettlement battles. By 2017, he was not only an MLA from the ruling party in Delhi, but also an elected board member of Delhi Urban Shelter Improvement Board. Understandably, the residents recall their past closeness with the MLA to me with some ambivalence, if not bitterness. As you walk towards the MLA's office, the local Pradhan reminisced how, quote, he gives us respect, acknowledges our presence, and even shares our cigarettes or BD if he smoke one. We feel good that he's our own, unquote. The MLS office that nestled between a newly built community toilet and a well-maintained park. As we entered his office, he arranged chairs for us to sit while simultaneously, simultaneously watching a professional league kabaddi match broadcast on TV. The official had a makeshift, uh, uh, the office had a makeshift gym, chairs for visitors, a TV, and a pair of millstones for grinding cattle feed. As more people streamed into his office, the Pradhan bantered, quote, see, MLA Sahib is very fond of building his body. He also raises cattle as a hobby. Look at those millstones. He grinds cattle feed every day, unquote. At this, at this uh, 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 moment, the MLA instructed, instructed a caretaker to provide cattle feed and medicines to the cattle in a shed at one corner of the park. The residents were in good spirits due to the informal atmosphere, the news of the board's decision to resettle, and the prospect of rectifying the gaps or errors in the documents with the help of the MLA. After all, their own MLA who had learned politics playing and socializing in the neighborhood was at the helm of political affairs that directly affected them. He narrated what occurred during the board meeting, answered their questions, and later invited everyone to a meeting to scrutinize the documents regarding their resettlement. The meeting was called for the following Sunday to address the alarming documentary challenges that beset them. The documents which are referred to as proof documents by both residents and various state officials provide knowledge about the numerical presence of the residents from a particular year and are necessary for them to be eligible for resettlement and basic amenities. The intermediaries such as neighborhood chiefs, social workers, government workers who mediate over various issues with state and non-state uh, agencies claimed that perhaps only 40 to 50 residents might possess error-free documents. And th hence, they called for a meeting of all 223 eligible residents listed in the High Court case. In early September, the residents gathered in the park again. A resident asked me to read out the names of the people, their father's name, their Jugi number, and their ID, ID numbers, mainly in ration cards or voter IDs. I read out the names and details of the 223 residents listed. Many residents were conspicuously absent and untraceable. Many residents whose names did not appear in the court case vehemently contested the list. A few of them verbally slandered the intermediaries who made the list for the court. SD exclaimed, quote, there were many Rajasthani residents, residents who originated from the Western state of Rajasthan, but I do not see any of them here. I don't see many from the Kabada camp either. Kabada camp is a part of the neighborhood known for recy recycling of Kabada or scrap materials. I see the names of many who Jugis have not been demolished yet. PP, one of the Sama Sevaks or social workers, must have included the names after taking money. All this happened because the government did not carry out any survey prior to the demolitions. The government people thought that they would get away without resettling us. This is sheer injustice, unquote. To this accusation, a Samasava argued, quote, these things happen. I was one of the five petitioners, but my name was deleted from the list because I could not go to the court 
to sign the petition. Those of you whose names did not appear must not have turned up that day. We will ask MLSI to add your name during the survey and verification process. We will request the government officials to verify one document instead of a slew of documents." Unquote. Many documents, including photocopies, remained illegible. The residents had surrendered their old ration cards, but are required to produce photocopies of the old ration cards. A few residents produced photocopies that were too light or too dark, and at times had portions missing around the edges. Eight years have passed since the neighborhood was demolished. And thus the documents and their photocopies have been subjected to rain, rats, and the ravages of time. The government staff had also made up errors. For instance, in one document, the staff had written over the misspelled name of a resident, but had forgotten to sign and authenticate the document. An eligible resident's son appeared with his mother's document displaying her misspelled name. In his claim for authenticity, the son reminded the MLA about the school bag he had received from him as a gift when he joined grade five almost 25 years ago, or 20, 20 years ago. He was 25 then. Other residents debated the sequence of the arrival of residents, the involvement of particular residents in major events, and the details about individual biographies and the life history of the communities. They were concerned that some residents could be excluded from receiving flats if they had errors in their documents. As you can learn from this story, the residents systematically attempt to enlist themselves in order to prove their residence and ultimately, and ultimately claim citizenship rights in the city. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Now let me turn to my second ethnographic vignette about the case of renaming of a transit camp. In 2010, the residents of Sitapuri transit camp attempted to reclassify themselves as regular, resettle, and legal. Sitapuri resident camp was developed as a temporary measure to, to resettle residents from Juki settlements on so-called prime land in the mid-1980s. Between 2003 and 2010, the residents have successfully fought court battles against impending displacement after the Resident Welfare Association of Lakshmi Colony, a middle-class neighborhood, of course, I'm using pseudonyms for all these names, petitioned the court for the demolition of the neighborhood. Since 2006, the primary political effort of the resident, residents has been to contest the temporary status of their resettlement. The state enunciation or sanctioning of categories like transit, temporary, illegal, and encroacher not only invested various population of Sitapuri with contradictory meanings, but also determined the legal status of their neighborhood. It then became incumbent upon the residents to challenge these categories through renaming and reclassification. The categories of transit and temporary implied their lack of numerical entrenchment in the city. Here, the legality of the neighborhood dependent, depended on the number of years they had lived in the neighborhood. In this case, the documentation of their presence in the neighborhood since the 1980s bolstered their claims for permanent resettlement. The residents attempted to rename their locality after one of the former prime ministers of India who ruled during the temporary resettlement. The effort signaled mutual endorsement of residents and the Congress party. The removal of transit and camp from neighborhood from the neighborhood's name and its replacement with the former Congress party prime minister's name and colony were seen as legitimate efforts towards regularization and permanence. Here, colony is a commonly used term for planned uh, or, or legal neighborhoods in Delhi. After negotiations with various politicians and government officials, the residents were successful in, in renaming their neighborhood. On August 20th, 2010, the residents decided to celebrate the occasion by organizing a ceremony for the unveiling of a stone sign, which also coincided with the birthday anniversary of the former prime minister. The residents had cleaned up the area and erected a makeshift stage. Since there was a drizzle, the residents sat in chairs facing the stage with umbrellas in their hands. A revolutionary and nationalistic Hindi film songs extolling the contributions of soldiers and farmers blared from loudspeakers. 
The residents patiently waited and occasionally inquired about the arrival time of their leaders with the intermediaries. The councillor arrived at 10 a.m. to oversee the arrangements and quickly left in his car. Finally, the MP, the MLA, and the councillor arrived at 11.30 a.m. and walked towards the stone sign. The unveiling of the stone sign was followed by the felicitation ceremony, during which the politicians were garlanded, eulogized, congratulated, right, in generous terms by key members of the neighborhood. However, a sudden downpour truncated the celebration and the politicians and residents rushed back to their homes. Despite being cut short, the renaming ceremony contributed to a semblance of regularization in the neighborhood, which in turn created optimism for the poor. After all, the Congress party MP, the MLA and the councillor were the ones to officially rename and unveil the stone sign bearing the new name. I was asked to take pictures of the event and circulate them to two or three key members of the locality. When I went to meet some residents with printed copies of the pictures, a Pradhan noted, quote, the day the members of the government come to demolish again, I will show these pictures to the MLA and ask him why he had to carry out this tamasha or drama of renaming before, unquote. As is evident from this remark, the, the practice of auto-archiving of the events by collecting and storing pictures, newspaper clippings, and other, and other artifacts steadily propelled the claims of the residents for more visibility and a secure foothold in the city. Next slide, please. Finally, let me share my third ethnographic vignette to provide the grounding for my theoretical arguments. The residents of the, of the Azad resettlement colony who are considered displaced eligible residents of Jugi Chopri settlements across the city have held countless dharnas or peaceful gatherings in front of the chief minister's house since they are resettled in 2000, demanding various basic amenities, including water, bus services, and garbage disposal. The residents noted that the gradual provisioning of various facilities in the neighborhood was made possible only after a protracted period of struggle. On March 17, 2011, I joined a few residents who had congregated at a halwai shop or an Indian confectionery in the evening to debate the dismal state of infrastructure in the neighborhood. The halwai shop owner, BC, squatted on the veranda and fried samosas in a deep and fried circular uh, uh, cooking pot. A portable TV rested on a glass door phrase that stored sub drinks behind him. The residents watched the proceedings of the lower house of the parliament and debated the state of affairs in the country. The Hawaii shop faced a road that connected the neighborhood to the main square. Street vendors and a myriad grocery shops and businesses plied their trades beside the road. The hustle and bustle of the neighborhood was evident as many residents descended from the main square and lanes and bylanes of the neighborhoods to shop or make a leeway to their way home. A garbage dump in an enclosed concrete structure stood across a park, which was barely 100 meter, meters from the Hawaii shop. The, the residents covered their faces to avoid the putrid smell and flies from entering into their nostrils and mouths while crossing the garbage dump. The dogs and pigs rummaged the garbage strewn across, strewn across the park. Young, many, uh, young, young men ferried cycle trolleys with plastic containers to sell potable water in the neighborhood. And the Hawaii shop owner at this time was visibly upset and expressed his anger to other residents. He had written from the Delhi Development Authority office without being able to meet officials to speak about the problems that beset the neighborhood. Despite incremental provisioning of services in their neighborhood over the years, the residents were appalled by what they perceived as the treatment of their neighborhood like a stepchild. As resident SS remarked, quote, the water line runs close to our neighborhood, but it supplies water to the distant Sarita Bihar, a middle-class neighborhood. However, our neighborhood has not received potable water yet, unquote. At Dharnas in 2010 and 2011, the residents warned that the politicians could lose as many as 36,000 votes, the number of votes in the Azad resettlement colony if the politicians were, were to ignore their demands. As the Halwai shop owner argued, quote, we invited the members of the parliament of the area 
to the neighborhood to discuss our problems. He called us to his office instead and said that he did not like the netagiri or leader activities of Zhugi people. Instead, he told us that he would do whatever, telling him that no one knew him in this neighborhood, although we had campaigned for him in order to garner votes during the elections, unquote. The MP's derogatory way of addressing the intermediaries and leaders of the neighborhood as Jhuki people upset residents. SS argued, quote, we intermediaries and residents have been spreading carpets and hoisting flags of the parties during various events, but we'd never get party tickets to contest elections, elections unquote. At the time of my fieldwork in 2011, residents were contemplating the nomination of their own candidate in the future councillor elections. As the residents remarked, quote, we are tired of filling up vehicles with party supporters and public displays of numerical strength for candidates. We want to challenge the politicians in elections, unquote. By 2017, the population of the Azad resettlement colony had increased to almost 250,000, although the eligible voting population remained approximately 42,000. Nevertheless, the resettlement, the resettlement colony, along with a nearby unauthorized colony, constituted a municipal ward. In the municipal elections of 2017, the residents successfully elected a councillor from their own neighborhood, thereby demonstrating their numerical strength. However, the election of a councillor from the neighborhood has not yet dramatically improved infrastructure of the neighborhood. Furthermore, the assertion of numerical strength and demographic calculus by neighborhood residents has yet to serve the interests of the entire community uniformly. Nevertheless, this ongoing struggle highlights the incremental, although uneven entrenchment of the poor into the political landscape of the city on their own terms. The three ethnographic vignettes discussed ever offer ample evidence regarding my theoretical uh, arguments concerning struggles for numerical citizenship that the poor residents of Delhi engaged to claim the right to the city by asserting their numerical strength. The legibility, visibility, and gradual entrenchment of these poor urban residents lie at the heart of a variety of incremental struggles. The poor build and navigate a multitude of relationships and social divisions and forge political connections in their claims-making endeavors. In the course of my book, I offer other ethnographic vineyards to illustrate my theoretical analysis and to support my empirical arguments, including tactics such as the mediated politics of intermediaries, the counter tactics of enumeration among residents, a, a range of legal struggles and media resistance tactics. Thus, although more recent scholarship on Delhi has addressed the processes of disposition, my primary focus is on the political agents of the poor themselves. In doing so, I concentrate on the ingenious strategies strategies and improvisational tactics they engage in on an everyday basis. Can you move on to the next slide, please? So I'm sort of glossing over the details and also not engaging with the literature that is very significant for my research. So you can read the book and learn about how I'm engaging with various scholars and some of you are present uh, um, uh, today. All right, let me now share some of the main theoretical arguments of my book. On one hand, the lives of the poor migrants are constrained by numerous numerical calculations of the state. On the other, the migrants participate, negotiate, and resist the technologies of the state through immediate counter calculations of citizenship struggles. In this respect, my primary contribution is to illuminate how numerical citizenship struggles address a range of dialectics. The monitoring and surveillance of the poor versus locality building, the technology of enumeration versus counter, uh, counter tactics of enumeration, especially to prove numerical presence in the city, legal classification and categorization versus popular processes of renaming and reclassification, projects of planning and legal erasure versus lived politics of auto-archiving, auto mnemonic strategies, performances, and speech acts during resistance demonstrations. In this light, I'm in conversation with a range of scholars working on the cities of the global south, especially uh, Partha Chatterjee, James Holston, Ananya Roy, 
Asha Gettner, Solly Benjamin, Asif Bayat, and Emma Tarlo. Um, how, however, I will not engage with the scholars in this talk uh, in the interest of time. My empirical insights concerning everyday political practices and citizenship struggles do not advance a normative theory of citizenship. I consider how the practices of the poor challenge a universal theory of citizenship. This challenge is especially pronounced when the locational disadvantages of the poor in various settings call for empirically grounded theorizations. In this light, I argue against a fetishization of the state as the dispenser of normative rights as conceptualized in liberal political theory. Instead, I contend that the state is neither the fountain of rule of law and social justice, nor an unaccountable entity from the perspective of the poor. Rather than the application of a normative set of rules and rights, I observe, I observe a shifting conception of rights and social justice with respect to the governmentality of the state. In this respect, I adopt a relational and processual approach to understand the politics of the poor in Delhi. I locate the struggles within an ensemble of social relations and institutional art, uh, arrangements in Delhi in order to fully understand the politics of the poor. I examine how the agency and political consciousness of the urban poor help them claim citizenship entitlements. As I show throughout my book, the struggles of claiming citizenship entitlement, entitlements are historically contingent and contextual. Numerical citizenship struggles drawn the commissions and omissions of various state agencies. The various organs of the state adhere to different principles of governance at different points in time, thereby creating a space for participation, negotiation, and resistance to state policies. Rather than keeping the state at arm's length as suggested by James Scott in another context, the poor attempt to embed their citizenship struggles within various structures of the state. In order to be state recognized, a Jogi Jopri settlement needs to house at least 50 households to begin with. In building their numerical strength, the poor engage with the beggaries of the police and municipal authorities initially, and then steadily enter into the field of electoral politics to advance citizenship claims. Displaying numerical strength remains an important aspect of mediation, mediations in the field of patronage politics. In this regard, the poor struggle to enlist themselves on the electoral rolls in order to be part of the political processes. In asserting numerical strength, the struggle for citizenship is premised on the documentation of a population's numerical presence in the city. I'm just not talking about numerical strength, but also the issues of el uh, eligibility and legibility, how they document themselves. That's also very key, right? So the poor become eligible for a panoply of citizenship rights in the city only upon the production of the proof of their presence from a particular date. The poor deploy ingenious strategies to obtain proof documents and contest arbitrary methods of classification that divide potential beneficiaries as eligible or ineligible. This entail processes of authentication and counterfeiting which contest numerical calculations of eligibility as well as processes of self-enumeration to challenge state enumerations, which are often, you know, deflated accounts of the state, right? That not many people live in this neighborhood. So, so numerical citizenship struggles drawn legal struggles uh, to undermine state classifications and state numbers and state categorizations. The poor contest legal classification uh, through mundane struggles and performative demonstrations in front of government offices, street corners, and neighborhoods. In these demonstrations, which are simultaneously peaceful and militant, the poor make use of their affective ties to, man to manufacture specific cultural idioms of protest. Such performances subvert the imposed categories and subjectivities of illegality and ineligibility and draw upon a repertoire of forms of protest. As I show throughout this book, numerical citizenship struggles constitute a performative politics that engages various idioms of speech acts and public performances. These struggles are shaped by forms of, forms of speciality, social cleavages along the lines of caste, income, gender, regional origin, and community networks, and by the involvement of activists and interlocutors. Thus, numerical citizenship struggles 
involved an ensemble of individual and collective contentions that drawn the expediency of political mediations, negotiations over documents and inscription, legal battles in the courts, and a variety of performances of popular resistance. These struggles encompass a universe of politics that is counter-calculative, and they drawn shifting, shifting effective ties, interactions, and demonstrations among poor people, their allies, and their representatives. The social relations and affective ties among community members change over time. The dynamic spatial and temporal dimensions of the struggles uh, shape the transformation of social relationships, political arrangements, and domestic bonds that emerge from demolitions and resettlements. The political subjectivities of the poor are continuously reconfigured in a dialectical relationship with state policies, especially when welfare and resettlement policies are being enacted. Furthermore, the change in political regimes and legal discourses and, and practices underpin the modalities and outcomes of politics. Throughout the course of this book, um, I show how the quest for numerical citizenship is not homogeneous or unilinear, but rather uneven and multilateral. Can you move on to the final slide, please? Now, let me briefly share with you the contents of my book. In chapter one, I provide a historical account of the formal, abstract, and largely depoliticized character of planning regimes in Delhi. I trace the shifts in the parameters of planning and the technology of, uh, technologies of statecraft in the implementation of the calculative protocols. I analyzed how an attempted passive revolution in urban planning, a reformist agenda to redistribute urban resources was subverted by Zugi demolitions policies during the implementation of the first master plan. Subsequently, I analyzed how urban planning facilitated the expansion of capital accumulation and spaces of leisure for Delhi's middle and upper, upper classes and enforced surveillance and ameliorative strategies for the poor. In chapter two, I analyze the ideological and practical motivation that underlie the planning of demolition and resettlement to begin with. Then I examine the social suffering endured by the poor as a result of the structural violence of demolition and resettlement in order to provide the context to analyze the numerical citizenship struggles in Delhi. In chapter three, I examine how various kinds of intermediaries mobilize a kind of arithmetic calculus that is an assessment of the numerical strength of the poor in the neighborhoods to demand space and infrastructure in the city. I address the tactics and techniques of three kinds of intermediaries, neighborhood chiefs, self-fashioned social workers, and lower-rung government workers who originate from and act on behalf of these informal settlements. The intermediaries possess a range of forms of capital and are defined by social identities and diverse sources of legitimacy and motivations. I explore how these intermediaries negotiate various claims by offering personalized services and demanding differential treatment instead of abstract and liberal justice by engaging in numerical citizenship struggles. In particular, I examine the role of intermediaries in establishing Juki settlements, fighting against demolitions, and advocating for basic amenities and resettlement rights. Finally, I investigate how alliances and solidarities are formed for the redistribution of rudimentary urban amenities and explain how the specific idioms and strategies of intermediaries entail various forms of exploitation, gendered exclusions, and dependencies. In order to gain access to welfare services and claim voting rights, Delhi poor engage in documentary struggles to prove existence in Delhi. Chapter four examines how numerical citizenship is claimed, negotiated, performed, and realized through various documentary, inscriptive, and enumeration counter tactics. Here, enumeration counter tactics include letter writing, office visits, self surveys, the solicitation of information through the right to information policy, as well as the processes of authentication and production of counterfeit documents. In chapter five, drawing on two court cases, one against demolition and one for resettlement, I consider the contingent circumstances that shape the negotiation of law and legal outcomes in Delhi. 
from analysis of legal negotiations in everyday context, I explore how poor people navigate the judiciary by rejecting legal and social classifications, building social relationships and alliances, and contesting existing land use and class relations. Through an ethnographic study of the judiciary, I provide an understanding of how, of how the law is lived, encountered, and challenged in low-income neighborhoods in Delhi. In this chapter, I show that the distinctiveness of legal cases offered, uh, you know, uh, offers insights into how law both constrains and enables numerical citizenship struggles in Delhi. With a focus on various ex exclusionary processes of urbanization and urban policies, chapter six examines the cultural idioms and performances of resistance employed by Delhi's urban poor in citizenship struggles. I consider the politics of peaceful demonstrations and militant struggles with a focus on three forms of peaceful resistance at particular historical conjunctures. Dharnas, peaceful gatherings, rallies, and felicitation or celebratory ceremonies. So these uh, constitute peaceful forms of protest. I, sh I show that while the displays of numerical strength in these demonstrations remain central, the protest events, especially felicitation ceremonies or congratulatory ceremonies, uh, contribute to the reinvention of community solidarity. In contrast, I show how militant protests are intelligently calibrated and mostly symbolic in nature, although they may entail direct verbal or physical attacks on specific targets. These forms of militant protest include gherao, which means uh, uh, encirclement, encirclement, rasta roko, which means road blockades, and julus, which means marches. Then finally, the conclusion ex explicates why the idea of numerical citizenship has analytical purchase. By evaluating theoretical and empirical resonances with the struggles of the poor in other mega cities, I offer a distinct approach to understanding citizenship and the right to the city. In identifying the merits and challenges of numerical citizenship, I emphasize the significance of the demographic calculus, the contingency of collective solidarity, and the range of improvisational tactics for establishing numerical presence in the city. In so doing, the theory of numerical citizenship that I propose is attentive to the dynamic nature of social spaces, the temporal dimensions of struggles, the salience of social divisions and alliances, and the heterogeneity of state practices that remain critical to understanding the political agency of the urban poor. I concluded some remarks on how recent legislation passed by the Indian government, the Citizenship Amendment Act, and subsequent plans to register citizens is affecting citizens in my, or residents in my hillsides and the implications for the struggles for the right to the city. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sanjeev. That was a very uh, lively, rich, and clear presentation. And uh, I mean, I think it really um, makes us feel like reading this uh, fascinating book. So, uh, Aprajita, I don't know how we proceed. I can see that we have already two questions in the Q&A. Um, I certainly have a number of questions myself. How, how should we start? Um, so, uh, we sort of take some of the higher, like sort of more theoretical questions sort of in between, but I mean, we also start with questions from the, which, which are not from the panel. So, uh, but then again, I think Mukta's question is, I think a good way to start off the discussion. And then we we'll come to Shraddha and Matt, because I think they kind of follow from what Mukta is asking. Uh, Mukta, do you want to just ask your question and then we can let him answer and then. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Aprajita. Sanjeev, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm sort of speaking to the central tension of we all know that these communities are certainly not homogeneous. And uh, you've already pointed out in your presentation, especially the case that, that you know, uh, of the demolition and resettlement, the first case of how certain communities, uh, you know, tend to get excluded or certain individuals tend to get excluded and they may be sort of identity aspects to those exclusions. So how does this actually work? When we talk about the concept of numerical citizenship, does this question of, 
of uh, numbers or or asserting uh, you know the asserting the numbers in the community actually propel communities towards some forms of inclusion or uh, do the inner fractures persist despite this i know this this is you brought this up in your concluding comments but if you could speak a little more to how this tension actually uh, works out and uh, is there any uh, can we can we hope that that uh, numerical citizenship is a way towards some form of inclusion where communities themselves uh, you know would like to bring in traditionally marginalized groups in order to bolster their numbers and bolster their claims Thank you. That, that's a great question, and it's a very, very relevant question, especially because uh, of the Citizenship Amendment Act. Right? When I'm talking about numerical citizenship, uh, the presupposition is, is that this is working out you know, in a democratic setting. right? So when the state becomes ethnocratic, to use, say, uh, or in ethical terms, then perhaps it will have uh, some, some other challenging issues. Of course, all through the book, I'm showing how fractured uh, uh, you know, uh, these this, uh, sort of communities are, you know, and of course, this is a politics of inclusion, but it also uh, sort of um, borders on various kinds of exclusions. I'm, I'm emphasizing on the formation of communities in, in these neighborhoods. So that's, that's one of my key findings. So it's all about a quest for collective solidarity. I'm not talking about, um, you know, the additive nature of numbers who come together and protest during uh, an event or voting uh, in the elections. But rather, I'm talking about locality building and how locality building is so central to collective solidarity. Now, what happens uh, during um, um, certain conjunctures? For instance, the conjuncture we're witnessing today, right? A uh, constellation of various kinds of forces shaping our politics in very exclusionary ways, right? So perhaps, uh, the theory has to attain to that, right? And 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 I actually interviewed some some of my residents um, after the Shahin Bagh uh, protests and over phone because it was at uh, the, the time of pandemic. And I clearly saw that um, uh, that that there are fractures. And 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 if you read my conclusion, I have I have a section uh, in my conclusion. So it, it clearly shows how collective solidarity is, is so tenuous, right? So, so it's a, it's a politics of inclusion, but it's also bordering on various kinds of exclusions. Um, when I talk about documentation, when I talk about um, the poor's ability to uh, counterfeit documents in order to propel, steadily propel their states, right? Uh, ironically, sometimes, you know, the, the authentic documents are not accepted by the state because there are some um, you know, errors, right? So there are many interesting issues. And if you read my uh, chapter four, that talks about documents and and it shows how arbitrary you know exclusionary the state practices are but nevertheless the poor have to be counted the poor poor have have the right to be counted they they try uh, tooth and nail to be counted so 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 this documentation process is very uh, salient and that would also mean that there could be uh, different kinds of fractures uh, uh, in in the communities I'll stop there. I'll, I'll just go on talking. I mean, this is this is a very key aspect of my work. Um, Thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mukta. Now, before we go to um, Shraddha and Matt, um, uh, we won't we don't give out uh, personal details of the speakers. Um, you're welcome to get in touch with CPR and uh, CSH for uh, questions that you might have to speakers, or reach him out to on Twitter. Or something, and then he can decide to get in touch with you. All right, uh, Shraddha, um, I'm uh, going to uh, ask you to speak up. First, I'll look for you. Yeah, I have allowed you to talk. Shraddha, Shraddha Jen, can you? Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I was just wondering, like, uh, at many uh, occasions, you have mentioned about. Um, uh, uh, leaders being chosen from within the communities, within these colonies. So I'm curious to know how um, was the extent of political rights that the residents had, like in terms of voter cards. So why I ask this is that also gave them the political traction to uh, 
uh, come together and bargain for their rights. So uh, some of them may be first generation migrants or maybe second generation migrants. So how do you uh, uh, place them in these uh, aspects? Uh, thank you. Can I, can I respond? <laughs> Sure. Thank you. That's a, that's a very good question and it will help me clarify. So, so I'm addressing this question all through the book. So I'm not saying that people are homogeneous. Of course, they're first generation migrants. It takes a certain amount of years to get your first document. And then uh, your documents may have different kinds of kami or errors, right? And then you have to fix those documents, right? And, and, um, and the, 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 uh, a phenomenon of under enumeration is so rampant in these neighborhoods. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's really uh, colossal. So, uh, and and also people who are renting Zugis, for instance, they are not eligible. Of course, the Amadmi Party has uh, um, now uh, uh, has a policy, populist policy to, to extend uh, resettlement rights to renters, right? Uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, they may struggle to get documents which will attest their um, sort of uh, uh, residence in one in any particular neighborhood right so um so these are very critical issues um i'm not i'm not saying it's a it's a, it's a unilinear uh, sort of homogeneous process that poor migrants come to the city and in 5 6 years they would become citizens with a panoply of rights and citizenships right uh, citizenship, citizenship right i'm not saying that uh, nevertheless i'm saying uh, that that okay we have to perhaps uh, move beyond um an analysis of disposition and to to uh, uh, examine what exactly happens when political reasons change or what happens in a democratic within court setting uh, how do people obtain their rights uh, so it's a situated uh, theory of citizenship in a sense uh, right it's a it's a contextual contingent uh, 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 theory of citizenship uh, very very attentive to conjunctures and very very uh, careful about uh, this these factors. So I'm not uh, remembering the kinds of fracture, the kinds of issues that I deal with in detail in the book uh, regarding ineligibility. Uh, but if you if you kindly go through uh, the book, perhaps you'll have a better sense of uh, what I'm trying to argue. But thank you for your question. Uh, that, that was really great. Thanks. Uh, looking forward to reading the book. Thanks. Thank uh, Matt, I've allowed you to talk, I think. Hi. Hi, is that, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Yes. Oh, great. Um, thanks, thanks, Sanjeev. That's really excellent work. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing both the books, um, hopefully. Uh, I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about the role of data and technology in the, the situations you look at and, and how that might have changed over time. Thank you. Right. So um, when I did field work, um, uh, this process of digitalization hadn't come into effect, you know. Uh, uh, so the predominantly uh, sort of work um, with paperwork. Uh, so basically, it's all about collecting documents, uh, enumerating yourself, putting yourself on the list. You know, even even other card. Uh, I actually did an ethnography of. Uh, uh, surveys and and documentation. So so it was a it was a it was a very uh, uh, sort of uh, interesting case in terms of how uh, inscrutable these processes are for the poor to document themselves and all. So that, that but so this, the question you're asking me, perhaps I I need to do uh, some extra work to uh, um, show how uh, digitalization and newer forms of technologies. Are coming into effect and 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 shaping this this entitlement rights, but mostly I, I dealt with bureaucracy and paperwork when I talked about documentation, when I talked about data, when I talked about enumeration. Did I answer your question? I don't know what exactly uh, you had in mind. So in terms of uh, no, that, that, I mean that's great. Thanks. Pa papers also uh, data, right? And the, the ethnography of the surveys and data again that would be fascinating to to look at. So thank you. Okay, um, I think before we move on, um, Stefani, you uh, do you want to just sort of discuss the your questions and then we can take on the 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, Sanjeev, I'd like to ask you first uh, two questions. I think one of the very interesting aspects in your work is that you have been observing this uh, tree uh, settlements over a long period of time. And in what you said, of course, I could you know, recognize some of the things I had observed when I was working you know, on unauthorized colonies, more particularly um, around 2008, 2009, but also uh, some things were really new. So um, th these two questions are really in this context. So the first one is about intermediation. Uh, you have mentioned the strongman, you have mentioned the self-styled social workers or social, uh, you know, so-called social workers. And transit camp. I, I found it fascinating to hear how the poor were actually playing what could be called also symbolic politics, right? Working on political communication um, towards, you know, um, facing the state, whereas we're more used to, you know, the reversed um, um, direction of this kind of politics. So my question is, you since you talk of, about performance, I suspect that, you know, this symbolic politics has produced effects. So, but can you tell us more about um, how uh, these people manage? I mean, concretely, you know, what was the process involved in changing the name of uh, the settlement? And and secondly, perhaps most importantly, have you been able to observe uh, what kind of tangible effects have you been able to observe? And you have mentioned, um, you know, affective emotional type of effects, a stronger sense of belonging, which is definitely something that should be taken seriously uh, in itself, but have there been uh, other effects? Now, I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Great questions. It will take a bit of time for me to answer all of them. Let me try. So um, the first, first question is about transformations. And, and uh, because I have a longer temporal frame, I could definitely see uh, those transformations. And it would be in hindsight, it actually helped that it took me so many years to write this book because uh, I'm sort of, you know, talking about the oscillations all through, right? So sometimes people are able to gain something, but then in in the next sort of court judgment, something else is happening. It's completely getting undermined. So I'm trying to sort of provide a longer fra a framework and to, uh, to show how effective ties, how community relationships, how community sentiments are changing over, um, you know, a very long uh, duration. So, uh, so how did it change? For instance, you know, uh, with the emergence of Aam Aadmi Party, right? And 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 your question about the role of NGOs and activists, for instance. So, my primary theoretical, uh, uh, one of my primary theoretical interventions is to uh, sort of uh, look at the politics of the poor on their own terms, right? And and that doesn't mean um, that I I don't sort of analyze the MB activities, contradictions, and, you know, and, and the intersection of the politics of the poor with other agents, like activists, for instance, or middle-class activist, activists, NGOs, or lawyers, even religious leaders. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing all of them together, and, and I'm showing uh, how they intervene and what kind of interventions they made, and were they helpful or were they not helpful, and how did the poor engage with them? For instance, they selectively adhered to some um, uh, the suggestions and with to the bewilderment of the activists, you know, they were selectively adhered to certain uh, uh, advice components of, of activists and interlocutors. So I, I show that. But when I talk about intermediaries, I'm basically talking about intermediaries who emerge or who originate from these neighborhoods. And I thought uh, that I should I should uh, classify them, and I uh, in order to provide a little more nuance and complexities in terms of uh, the nature of mediation. So that's why I, I, I sort of, and everybody has, I mean, everybody has done magnificent work on Pradhans and I'm also trying to sort of build on that work. Uh, but I'm also showing how, uh, you know, various kinds of intermediaries uh, sort of differ from each other in these neighborhoods, for instance. And of course their activities are overlapping, 
But uh, uh, if one sort of intermediaries are building on their political capital, uh, irrespective of their caste and income, because you can find um, pradhans of each and every caste in, 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 in neighborhoods, uh, you know, but social workers are mostly upper caste, uh, you know, intermediate uh, uh, mediators with a little bit of cultural capital who could interpret uh, documents, you know. And then I'm also talking about government workers, especially if they are working with this, with a court as a peon or electrician or you know, uh, and what kind of role they could play when they are blurring the boundary between state and society. And that's a lot of work on this, right? And and how they leak information, what kind of help they can uh, give to the community, as well as how they can, you know, corner some resources, you know, the paved roads are always in front of their houses or, you know, so so oh, I'm showing all that. So, and of course it's changing over time um, because of old days, because of the, the party in power, you know, Amadmi party had its own uh, sort of uh, um, uh, mediators, right? So I was sort of, so then I started seeing Pradhans, I started interviewing Pradhans of Amadmi party. I, so it's not the new politics as such, it's also retaining some old, old, politics, the characteristics of old patron, patron uh, client politics, uh, despite you know, the articulation of a newer self and newer politics of the performance and all. So it, it still uh, sort of uh, borders on some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, patronized politics. About uh, the performative dimensions of my uh, 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 sort of work, uh, or how did these performances have real effects? So, um, so I'm trying to sort of uh, have a holistic perspective. I'm not saying the performance would have the final say or over-determine everything. Um, nevertheless, I also show how, for instance, when Sitapuri transit camp was uh, uh, sort of uh, targeted to be demolished, people uh, sort of uh, uh, performed and and sort of had these spectacles, you know, and there are, there are all the speech acts, uh, you know, women stood on the rooftops and, and uh, threatened to jump with the children, you know, um, they uh, uh, sort of uh, put cut branches um, on the roads and block the roads, you know, and there are all the speech acts, you know, all the all the naras or sloganeering that I talk about in the final chapter and, and infected with particular cultural idioms, for instance, effigy burning, right? Delhi Sarkar is uh, dead Sarkar, effigy burning, right? So all those things I show, in order to claim, say, for instance, a certain citizenship, uh, you know, uh, I remember, anyway, let me stop because there are details I'll be sharing otherwise. Uh, finally, so what are the tangible effects they have? Uh, so, so the point is, I mean, uh, the point is they do have tangible effects and so of course the reclassification and renaming of the neighborhood, I'm not so sure what tangible effects it has. Um, uh, nevertheless, the idea is that you prepare yourself for another court battle if there's a case, right? So why did the government change our uh, neighborhood's name? Why is it Dada, you know, uh, resettlement uh, transit camp instead of, uh, I mean, why did they sort of start uh, write resettlement? So these are ways they fought in the courts. And this is how, I mean, uh, you know, I'm drawing on Burdin quite a bit in this chapter to talk about um, how this, this language games uh, play out in the courts. And, and how they have real effects, right? Uh, eligibility, ineligibility, you know, how language has power, how they have real effects and how that sort of um, uh, structures uh, the views and verdicts of judges when. So um, I'm, I'm, I could be a little cryptic here, but I'm not sharing the details. So, uh, Thank you, right. I guess we, we have to read the book to get the details. This is a way of you know, advertising my book. This is you good, know. we are picking up. Picking up tricks to do that. Uh, I think a lot of uh, three good uh, question um, questions here, and we have to keep to time. There are uh, we have about twenty minutes. Uh, so um, Rajendran, then Uttam, and Sotarupa, and uh, somebody had raised their hand. So we'll uh, Rajendran. Just a second. I'm just gonna. Um, I yeah. Uh, go ahead. Rajinder, you can go ahead. I have allowed you to speak. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. You just have to speak up. Uh, yeah, I am a, a 
urban right activist in uh, Bangalore. And I'm very happy to see uh, the book because it is uh, reflecting a lot of our experiences uh, here in Bangalore because we consider the urban deprived communities are economic refugees of this country. So the economic refugees and also connected with the caste question. But I don't know how far Sanjeev has really uh, uh, dealt the question of uh, lower caste, especially the Shadil caste and Shadil tribes and the uh, minorities in this country who are also economic refugees without any assets, without any things, without any uh, productive assets in, uh, on their name. So that's why I tell they are not poor. Because this urban poor needs, word needs to be eradicated. They are not poor. They are creators of wealth of the entire uh, nation, including all the cities. So we think the ownership in the city is being denied. So they are considered as unwanted. I mean, I am very happy to hear a lot of words and concepts are very much into things that we are, what we are imagining for last two, two three decades in Bangalore. So in Bangalore, Hyderabad, Chennai and all, we are working in uh, multiple cities where I'm very happy to see this, but um, the, I'm very, I want to really thankful to bring the central issue of citizenship of this so, in this whole issue, because citizenship is a central question to all the other things, either in terms of representation, either in terms of access to resources, either in terms of denial of human development for these people, either a denial of livelihood, meaningful, dignified life for these people, and especially the caste, how caste operates in the governance system. So I'm very happy to see a lot of the concepts and things are intertwined in this, especially cultural idioms and the, the very many things, very many things. I'm very happy. I, I will very quickly uh, buy this book and um, uh, we'll uh, definitely use it in our context, in our community mobilization. And um, we are actually uh, mobilizing the uh, uh, the urban urban deprived communities. In fact, we had once uh, in one of the eviction context, we uh, uh, way back in 2015, we held a protest in Jantar Mantar about the same issues of the citizenship and representation and access to resources to the this uh, non citizens unwanted communities in this city. Uh, I think I am very happy. I'm just I want to. Uh, uh, register these things. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. No, that, that's a that's a wonderful comment. Yeah, I I, I won't I won't disagree. Of course, they are creators of wealth, and at at some point, I'm I'm talking about their production uh, and social uh, productive and social reproductive work, and how they subsidize the houses of the middle class, and and how they sort of create wealth. Um, you know whether we could call them urban poor or not. I mean, maybe I have to re rethink. But of course, they are the creators of wealth, and and they sort of uh, uh, through their productive activities and through their social reproductive activities in various neighborhoods and various uh, households, right? So I I would not disagree at all. Uh, you asked a very interesting question about caste, and and that's a very salient question. Uh, um, uh, I do show how caste operates in these neighborhoods. May not be may not be as much as I should have done, and that's that's my second book. So I'm, I'm to just give you a brief overview of my second book. I'm actually you know, sort of uh, comparing and contrasting two different castes, one intermediate caste and one Dalit caste, uh, in their quest for social mobility in the city. And they work as plumbers, and they originate from one particular district in Odisha. You know, so I'm I'm comparing and contrasting, and so so my focus is on caste in this second world. In this, uh, in the in my first uh, book, of course, most of the people living in these neighborhoods are from marginalized communities. We have to accept that. So most of them are Dalits. Most of them are uh, uh, OBCs, or so a few of them are uh, upper caste uh, people, right? So I'm showing uh, um, fractures, uh, and, but I'm not a sort of. Uh, uh, it's not a book about uh, how. Uh, it's not as much a book about how Dalits perhaps would have difficulty uh, uh, gaining something uh, uh, rather than talking about uh, some sort of a politics of the community represented by uh, 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 different caste and different inc uh, income groups to stay put in the city. So maybe, uh, maybe the book will not have um, uh, sort of uh, very, very uh, amplified uh, sort of uh, 
you know, focus on, on each and every issue. Uh, so I may be glossing over, for instance, uh, I'm aware of that because my narration had to build the story of how they want to be counted, you know, and especially the lip citizens because they are the majority. Uh, I'm, I'm clarifying that, but, but I'm not uh, sort of focusing on uh, inter-community uh, dynamics as much as I might have done perhaps. Because my narration is about how they try their uh, best, uh, how they try tooth and nail to be counted. So nevertheless, I, I have uh, shown all through the book how there are fractures, how uh, who is missing out, um, the caste ex exclusions, gendered exclusions, uh, what happens to Muslims, especially after the passing of uh, CAA. I hope I, I answered your question and, and thanks for your comment. Thank you, Sanjeev. Welcome, sir. Um, Uttam. Uh, just a second. Is Uttam Singh not here? I think Uttam Singh has left. Uh, if you have, if you haven't left, then just raise your hand. Uh, Satarupa, I'm going to just, uh, yeah. Oh, I've allowed you to talk. Uh, am I audible? Yes. So, uh, good morning, Professor. That was a really nice presentation, and I'm also working in Delhi or in my PhD. So, I think it will be very enriching for my work also. And I'm really looking forward to read the book. Uh, so, basically, when I was listening, uh, like I was hearing your presentation, I just have one question like, how you are conceptualizing community? Because, uh, like, as for my understanding, community is a term which has been defined in from many approaches, from many perspectives. So I was thinking like whether you are uh, like whether you are addressing it as synonymous to colonies or like what. And in case you are uh, like like defining it as synonymous to colony, so I would like to know in case there are some variations like you talked about caste, you talked about income groups. So what about the intra-community variations? So are that so does that have any impact upon the numerical citizenship upon the documentation process? So I really want to know that. So thank you. Should I respond? Thank you. Um, uh, thanks. Thanks again. So, <clears throat> so when I talk about community, I I talk about the contingent and contextual formation of a community. They're not given naturalized community as such. So how do you build a community despite divisions, despite a Kabada camp right opposite another lane, which is which is not uh, the the locus of um, recycling work. Right? How do people across divisions come together? How do they uh, draw on their intra caste or intra community solidarity to, uh, you know, ex extend that solidarity for an inter caste, inter community solidarity to fight against a bulldozer? Right? Uh, because you have, we have to understand that their identity is also emerging out of their embeddedness in particular stigmatized. Spaces, as one uh, interlocutor told me, politicians may divide us, but the reality is that uh, to survive here, you need vaichara or brotherhood, right? Could be a, sort of. So, so how how is that brotherhood uh, sort of uh, uh, constituted? Of course, it's, it's very very um, uh, it's a very tenuous uh, uh, formation of community. But but I'm trying to sort of emphasize that they are not working or fighting as discrete individuals. Even when I'm talking about numerical strength, um, I'm not talking about the additive force of individuals coming together and demonstrating something, but rather how they build locality despite their divisions uh, and primarily emerging out of their, uh, out of their shared stigma uh, because they're embedded in particular spaces. Nevertheless, despite this, there are divisions. There are divisions. The CAA has fractured it further. You know, the Dalits would perhaps lose out on many things. The contractors would invariably be, you know, intermediate or upper caste, uh, you know, uh, and the, and the scrap, uh, scrap sort of workers would most likely be Dalit workers. So there are di differences in terms of income and all. But my narration has to do with how do, how do they survive? Or rather, what is their counter tactics or what is their run with as, as people kept on telling me? So that's my uh, main sort of uh, 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 contribution. Um, um, 
nevertheless, I'm attentive to what you're saying. So I'm trying to show how they are, and, and we have to remember these are very stigmatized spaces. Uh, and most of the people here belong to the lower ranks of our society, right? And they create wealth, but they are the poor, as uh, um, you know, uh, one of our um, uh, interlocutors uh, told us today. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Rachna, I'm going to allow you to talk. Go ahead. Rachna? Hello. Hey, yeah. am yeah. I audible? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rautre, uh, I want uh, wanted to know from you, so your work has three settlements, a set of people, and a process of enumeration. And when you say it's an ethnography, I, uh, I'm trying to imagine the immense uh, collation of data you would have uh, uh, had and also uh, the urban local body politics in in these uh, years you know I, I suppose it's 2007 to uh, 2017 or 18 right how how, uh, how uh, i mean I, i'm sure at certain level uh, all three these the the three settlements people and process they, they would have had their own stories which are you know so overlapping with the process of enumeration and politics of enumeration. And also one thing, uh, doctor, uh, uh, urban uh, poor and especially the migrants, the uh, marginalized uh, migrants, uh, uh, don't you feel that they, uh, because of, uh, you know, paper, uh, ident paper which uh, identifies them uh, and uh, ensures them certain uh, entitlements, even at their native place, they, they, they understand the importance uh, of it. Thank you. Uh, I didn't get the last part, so the, they don't understand the importance of it. Back in their uh, country of origin. Back in I, their, uh, uh, place may I, may I uh, elaborate on it? Sure, sure, please. Huh? What I'm trying to say is uh, when we uh, are looking at urban poor, uh, migrant urban poor, they already have a, a template which tells them how important paper is. You know, in the native place, uh, we, we, uh, we're talking in your study, 2007. Huh? We, uh, if, we, if we look at where they, had, uh, they come from, whether it is through Anganwari, through uh, various, uh, you know, elections happening in their village or urban localities where they were, they would be having this uh, template of how important the paper is. Paper. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah. I do agree. So. So. Um, so. I mean, that is something striking. I found out uh, among the plumbers. Just to a tangent, um, none of my plumbers, uh, or, or, or plumber interlocutor, had document, right? Uh, or rather, the labor card. And we are trying to organize, and we now I'm trying to do remotely and trying to organize and start a union among the plumbers because none of them had uh, um, a labor card because they considered themselves as itinerant migrants who re ultimately return back to their um, village rather than build a concrete structure and live there, right? So, but, but in, in Jugi Zupri colonies and in, in these informal settlements, um, of course, they are aware of, of documentation and, and various kinds of enumeration, um, but there is this dream of staying put. So, so there is this fight or struggle uh, to gain something from, from the city or from, from the government. So that is the primary sort of focus. Uh, so so if, you, if you compare and contrast between say the plumbers and the urban poor, and of course the plumbers are also uh, poor. Um, so that, that's something striking uh, I, I found, right? Um, your question about, uh, the other question was about, um, did this processes change and how did I? Yeah, so I have followed through all, all, all this time. So for instance, I know exactly who is getting what. For instance, 
um, until uh, October 2021, only three people got resettlement plots, resettlement flats. I uh, followed them, them up. They were getting in Baprola. They, they fought to get it in Dwarka. I have mentioned all that, you know, and one of them actually passed away. So, uh, so, so, uh, uh, so it, it was inherited by her, by his daughter, and now you know. So I I have followed through that, and uh, and then I I for instance, um, you know, when they submitted documents, what are the issues? How they wanted to authenticate themselves? How they wanted to reconstruct their own biographies? You know, uh, that intersected with various events in the city. You know, how they convinced their MLA to say that they really belong to the city. You know, one person's uh, documents were gutted due to a fire. And his name was mentioned in newspapers. So that was his claim for authenticity. Look, my name is here in these newspapers, and you cannot deny me uh, uh, a flat uh, uh, because I don't have the requisite documents. So I have followed through all this, all these interlocutors over a long period of time. Whenever I've gone to Delhi, I've met them and followed their story, and that has helped me have a much uh, 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 clearer view of what their politics all about. And then I came up with this idea that well documentation is so key and, and numerical strength uh, is also so, so key. It's not legality, but also they're, they're turning it around and talking about the strength uh, and their documentation and their legibility in the city. Okay. Um, yes, um, I think uh, there's a follow-up comment, which she, yeah, she, I think she agrees with uh, what you're saying. Uh, it's 1054. Um, uh, I'm just saying. Yes, Stefani, you want to? I may. I have one last question. Uh, it might be a big one, so please feel free to interpret the question as you want. But in your conclusion, you mentioned um, shifting conceptions of social justice. Could you elaborate on that? So, so I'm, I'm I'm trying to argue that state is such a fractured entity, and 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 uh, state is so heterogeneous. So so there are all the is shifting conceptions about social justice as well. For instance, people who are the least political after the um, 2010 verdict, their refrain was not Kusini Hoga, nothing will happen. They all of a sudden get got politicized, right? Uh, because of some favorable verdicts. Uh, and so, so I don't see the state as the fountain of law as such, but how people have shifting notions. And I do not think these are tyrannical structures as perhaps Passage you would argue. So I'm showing how these ideas shift over time. Neither the the state is an is an unaccountable entity, nor it's kind of the fountain of the rule of law that you know this is there. So you you can claim it any day. I, I show how arbitrary and how how uh, you know absurd the process is. How counting is such an absurd process. Um, it's it's not. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. Imp uh, the, the implementation is not like the way it has been imagined. Uh, yeah. Rather, there are so many uh, gaps and 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 uh, uh, um, sort of errors in terms of uh, how these things actually work out and how these things actually play out uh, uh, in real time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, there's a well. The person isn't here, but I think the uh, comment he made was pretty interesting about. Uh, how um, you consider the action of the state? Uh, it, it's it's basically the 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 welfare as a contested uh, category as as something that is a responsibility to the state, but also something that requires the citizen to be fully documented. I mean, I'm sort of extrapolating from what he's saying, but um, I think in terms of like a like lineage of writing, uh, there's Tarangani Sri Raman. And, um, uh, and and Nazima Parveen, and I think yours would be third in line with, and of course, uh, Sushmita Pati's new work. I think so this would be fourth in this line of recent literature on Delhi's, uh, the, this culture of uh, paperwork, paper regimes, and also the way uh, people themselves want to be documented or talk back to the state, but which is not within this, uh, this, this uh, simple, like relationship of dominance and resistance, but something in the middle. And um, I think that's that's so interesting to uh, see. Any other, uh, do you want to see, do you want to add anything else? I mean, I have questions, but I'll ask them later once I read the book. So, uh, no, no, I mean, that was a comment or do we have a question? 
No, no, I'm just trying to finish up because there are three minutes. And I, you were very clear about 11 o'clock. But have you have you engaged with the, the like Tarangini and Nazima? Yeah, I've engaged with Tarangini's work. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay, okay. Because Nazima Parveen's new work is, um, which is Contested Homelands, is about not necessarily your um, area, but uh, it is uh, as a, like the, uh, the Muslim neighborhoods and ghettoization. But again, she's ta not taking ghettoization as a, as a pre-given phenomenon, but uh, looking at uh, how uh, documentation works to ghettoize and, um, but again, moving away from like surveillance state and the usual way of think thinking about colonies as like already surveilled and already governed. Um, so yeah, you'd be, I like, I think that'd be a no, good please. historic, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Uh, okay, I think we're almost, um, you know, uh, at the end of this uh, session. So thank you so much, uh, Sanjeev, for uh, this great uh, discussion. Thank you, everybody. I just want to um, inform everybody, as you told me, that um, the introduction of the book is available on the site, on the website of uh, Stanford University Press. And the book, of course, is The Right to be Counted, The Urban Poor and the Politics of Resettlement in uh, Delhi. So um, we're all looking forward to you know, reading the book and the next one about the plumbers, the now famous plumbers of, of Delhi. And uh, Aprachita, do you want to say something about the next uh, session? I actually, I don't know who is speaking next time. Uh, I'm not sure. This one was the <laughs> 150th workshop. And I think the next one will happen when it happens <laughs> we will we will send out mails uh, two weeks in advance but thank you for sanji for um, for this uh, for this for this event and uh, thank you for introducing the book on this form like on this you're very uh, welcome yeah, okay thanks all right okay. thank you very much bye bye everybody bye. Bye.